Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, Parks Lecture. My name is Mark Cornwall from the History Department. Um, I'm a historian of the late Habsburg Empire and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's uh, prestigious annual Parks Lecture. Um, last year, um, as I'm sure you know, we had to cancel the lecture because of COVID. So we're very pleased that so many of you can join us in this online version of our traditional parks lecture. And we have the privilege this year uh, to have our president and vice chancellor, Professor Mark Smith, chairing the evening. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna be hosting the evening and managing the discussion after the lecture. Uh, so please post your questions using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen or the chat box for comments. And you can do this during the lecture, you can do it as we're going along, or you can leave it until the end and after the lecture. So that's the setup for the evening. And um, I'm gonna hand you over now to the Vice Chancellor to introduce the lecture. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Mark, for that introduction. And thanks for the invitation to uh, open this Parks uh, lecture. It's a great privilege to, uh, to do that and to, uh, to be here this evening. In fact, one of the great privileges of my job is that you get to see the very wide range of things that occur uh, across the university, uh, from things in the humanities to engineering, etc. And very much looking forward to hearing tonight's uh, lecture. But I'm going to start by making uh, a few remarks about the Parks Institute. I'm sure uh, many of the people here know more about it than I do, but it the place on the record why we're here this evening because we're a fact here to honor the uh, Reverend Dr. James Parks, who is the inspiration behind uh, the Parks Institute for the study of Jewish, uh, non-Jewish uh, relations. Uh, and James was one of the most remarkable figures in 20th century Christianity. He was ordained by the Church of England in uh, 1926, uh, and he campaigned against the rise of fashion, uh, racist nationalism in Europe as early as the 1920s. And we know what uh, that led on to, and especially through his work, uh, with the International Student Service uh, and the Student Christian Movement. Uh, as a tireless fighter against anti-Semitism in all its forms, including from within Christianity, he helped rescue Jewish refugees during the 1930s and campaigned for the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. Uh, during the Second World War, he helped found the Council of Christians and Jews and worked throughout his career in promoting religious tolerance and mutual respect between those of all faiths and none. And it couldn't be more relevant today as it was then, basically. We still uh, are dogged with some of these, uh, these issues. Uh, Parks wanted to donate his library to a university so that future generations could develop his research and interests. And a home was found for them, uh, his materials, here at the University of Southampton in 1964. And we've had the great privilege uh, of housing them uh, ever since. So after over 50 years of growth and development of the Parks Institute as a community of scholars, archivists, librarians, students and fellows, it's come a long way uh, in uh, reaching that vision that James has set out. On the academic side, the Institute's expertise covers antiquity uh, to the 21st century and is wide ranging in geographical scope. Uh, amongst the specialist interests of its members are the study of the ancient world, migration, maritime studies, Eastern Europe, Holocaust studies, heritage, and the history of ideas. The Parks Institute has been described as a key distinctor of international importance at the University of Southampton. And in my role as vice chancellor, I very much look for those things that make the university stand out. And it's no doubt that the Parks Institute is one of our, is one of our jewels. Uh, it's led to the public, uh, public engagement in this whole field of the relationship between Jews and non-Jews and Jewish identity and culture more broadly. And as I said a few minutes ago, nothing is, is just as relevant today as when it, was, uh, when it was set up. The success of the Parks Institute reflects not only the commitment of its dedicated staff, but also I hope the wider support of the University of Southampton, but also the range of partnerships with a number of organizations outside Southampton. Uh, we also are dependent on the generous donations, particularly from the Ian Carton Charitable Trust and these continue to make the work of the Institute possible. And we're very grateful for them. The Institute has gained support for its research from a wide range of national and international funding bodies, including for its three scholarly journals, Jewish Culture and History, Patterns of Prejudice and Holocaust Studies. 
We're especially proud of the Institute's work in public engagement, which brings our expertise to many in our community, including in schools, colleges, and also through public events and arts and culture initiatives. The Parks Institute offers students a unique range of study in the field of Jewish, non-Jewish relations. And of course, the Institute introduces students to the wonderful holdings of the Park Library and the Jewish archive collections held in our own Hartley Library. Many colleagues, partner organizations and friends and donors contribute to the work and the achievements of the Institute for which I wanna thank them. But it's also good to be able to recognize the excellent work done by our students. Which brings me to the first formal part of this evening, which is the prize giving. Uh, and for that, I'm going to hand over to the director of the Parks Institute, uh, Claire. Claire. Thank you very much, Mark, for your kind words about the Parks Institute. So the Parks Lecture is an opportunity to announce a variety of prizes every year that have been awarded to undergraduate, postgraduate, um, and PhD students over the last two academic years. So since we didn't have a lecture last year, uh, I will uh, announce the prizes for 2018, uh, 19 and 2019, 20. And we are very, uh, really thankful for the generous donations that have allowed these prizes. So the, the most prizes first. So the annual Moss Memorial Prizes are offered each year in memory of Stephen Moss and his mother, Daphne. Stephen was a student here at Southampton and Daphne was president of the Society of Women Writers and Journalists. We are grateful to the generosity of the Moss family, who with support from the Society of Women Writers and Journalists established these prizes to be awarded annually for the best essays on a Jewish non Jewish related topic in both uh, undergraduate and postgraduate category. So we had three winning students in 2018-19 and three in uh, 1920. Most Moss Prizes are here tonight, as is Mrs. Elizabeth Moss, if you want to say a few words. Hello. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to attend um, this uh, prestigious lecture. Um, I'm here really to represent my father-in-law, who's now very elderly. Um, and Stephen Moss was my husband. He sadly died young. I met him at Southampton and um, my father-in-law was very um, interested in the Parks Institute from when we were students um, because he was interested in the inter interaction between Jews and non-Jews. He was Jewish himself um, and it's really, really rather fitting that I'm not Jewish. So uh, when I um, married my husband, um, we had our own version of Jewish non-Jewish relations. Um, but I'm very happy that my father-in-law has been able to continue with this prize, which has been running for, I think, over 10 years now. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to congratulate the prize winners and um, hope that they find the, the gift they receive of use to them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. So for 2018-19, the undergraduate award went to Nico Zavru Blackstock, a second year student then, for his essay on how far was the Birkat Haminim a key factor in the parting of the ways between Judaism and Christianity. I think he's not here. The postgraduate award went to Eleanor Joyce for her essay on how did Athanasius of Alexandria respond to Jews, pagans and Christianities in the fourth century. CE. A third prize was split between Robert Thompson, who, um, on how has historians understood British memory of Belson, and Nathan Thrill, who worked on the predominance of economic grievances over nationalism as a driving force for Austro Hungarian anti Semitism, 1873 1911. And I think Nathan is here. In 20 19 2020 the undergrad award goes to Jonas Campbell who is here uh, for his essay assessing the representation of an imperial power in the apocalyptic text for Ezra and it's uh, uh, you were a first year student it was a very impressive essay uh, the postgraduate award goes to Sam Ogden for his essay on the pogroms of the Russian civil war 
a third wave of anti-Semitism. Well done, Sam. The third prize goes to Elena Lokia for her essay, Examining the Zionist Responses to the Holocaust during Israel's pre-state period compared to Israel's Zionist attitudes surrounding the Eichmann trial. Well done, Elena. I would now like to award the David Cesarani Dissertation Prize. In, so I'm not sure if Dawn uh, Waterman, I think she, she had a work commitment, so she couldn't be here with, with us. So David was professor of modern Jewish history for many years in the history department and Parks Institute, and he contributed to its growth and success in many different ways. He was an inspiring teacher, and I'm sure that he would have been fascinated by the research of this year's, um, of last year and this year winners. So in 2018-19, the winner was Liam McGlynn, who is here for his work on gender in the art of the Weimar Republic. Uh, well done. And this year, or last year, 19, uh, 1820, we had two winners. So Daniel Rickards for his dissertation on the next evolutionary phase of Holocaust denial. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> And many congratulations also to Isabel Townsend Brown for her dissertation on unfeminine behavior in Nazi concentration camps, the use of violence and sexuality as methods of survival among female prisoners. We have also received donations to fund several PhD scholarships, which is very remarkable and very appreciated in these uh, times where funding for PhD student studies in, in humanities is so scarce, so an anonymous donation has allowed us to create the James Parks uh, Postgraduate Scholarship in honor of the work of Dr. Uh, Dr. Reverend James Parks. So through this important scheme, it is hoped that a new generation of academically young scholar will be encouraged to take further the work of James Park. Parks. The scholarship rewards students working on the church and the Holocaust or Christian Jewish relations or uh, Jewish, Jew Jewish non-Jewish relations. The joint winners for last year were Joanna Galanaki, who is here, <laughs> who uh, works on the Etzheim synagogue in Crete, and Nicola Woodhead for her work on the transnational dimension of kinder transport. This year, the winner is Uri Agnan for his work on music, as activism, and more specifically, his project, Antisemitism, a musical. Finally, we have also received a donation this year from Larry Agron, a long-standing supporter of the Parks Institute to reward two PhD students working on any aspects of Jewish non-Jewish relations. And the two winners this year are Anushka Alexander Rose, and uh, for her work on Vladimir Nabokov and the Jewish question, and Joanna Galanaki for her work on the Etzheim Synagogue in Crete. So well done to all of you. And I now um, give the floor back to Professor Smith. OK, so uh, just uh, to say uh, uh, well done to all of those winners. And it reinforces the point I made at the start that in a university as complicated and as ex extensive as the University of Southampton, you can sometimes not realize what goes on by hearing those titles. It was really very uplifting to hear the type of work that goes on and the research and uh, education that's being carried on by the Parks Institute and the students in it. So well done to you all. But also can I say thank you very much to the people who supported the prizes uh, because uh, you know it's with through support like that that we can recognize some of the outstanding activity that our students undertake. So thank you very much on behalf of the university. That then allows me to uh, move on uh, to the central event. I wasn't going to say the main event because uh, it downplays all of those winners that we've just had, but uh, the absolutely central event tonight, which is uh, our guest speaker. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Miller, who is Associate Professor in Nationalism Studies uh, at the Central European University. And briefly talking to Michael earlier, uh, this uh, university has had to be relocated for well-known reasons uh, from its former home in Budapest to where Michael's sitting now in Vienna. So uh, Michael's joining us from uh, Vienna this evening. Uh, and he's the co-founder of the university's Jewish Studies Programme. He received his PhD in history from Columbia, 
where he specialized in Jewish uh, and Central European history. And his research focuses on the impact of nationality conflicts on the religious, cultural and political development of Central Europe Jewry in the long 19th century. His articles have appeared in uh, the Slavic Review, Austrian History Yearbook, the Simon Dubno Institute Yearbook, the Jewish Quarterly Review, and the AJS Review. Uh, his book, Rabbis and Revolution, The Jews of Moravia in the Age of Emancipation was published by Stanford University Press in 2011. He is currently working on the history of Hungarian Jewry uh, titled Monoville, uh, A Tale of Two Hungaries. We are very lucky to have him here with us tonight uh, at this prestigious lecture. And we're now going to hear him speak on Budapest, Austria, Hungary, and its Jews at the Fan de Cercle. So, Michael, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you very much, Claire, for inviting me to Mark for moderating to President and Vice Chancellor Smith for the introduction. Also, um, Kathy Strana, who I think had a lot to do with uh, me being invited here. I assume she's out there somewhere. I want to thank her. Um, I also, oddly enough, you know, I have COVID to thank for this audience out here tonight. This was supposed to be, I think, a fairly small, modest event in Southampton. And now it's a, a much larger event um, on Zoom. So I'm not really thanking COVID, but this is, I guess, one of the, uh, the silver linings of this pandemic that is out there right now. Um, I um, want to start off by sharing my screen. Um, okay. So what I want you to do right now is imagine that it's 1892 and you're a foreigner in Budapest, as it says in the satirical cartoon in front of you. Um, you're this uh, individual named Lord Somebody, who was the tall Englishman on the left. And I am the short porter over there um, who doesn't have a name. He's just called Porter number 164. And I'm gonna read you a dialogue right now. Um, the guide says, at Calvin Ter, or Calvin Square, I showed you the church of the Calvinists. On the lower bank of the Danube, I showed you the church of the Greek Orthodox. That stump over there is the church and that domed basilica is the Church of the Catholics. And he points to all these different buildings you see in the background. And then the British tourist points at the large Moorish house of worship that you see on the right with the two towers. And he says, and what is that building with the two towers? And the, gu the guide dutifully responds and says, that my Lord is the synagogue for the inhabitants of Budapest. Meaning that this is the uh, house of worship for the population of Budapest. When the satirical cartoon was published in 1892, Budapest's 100,000 or so Jews made up just over 20% of the city's total population. At the time, Warsaw was the only metropolis in Europe that had a larger Jewish population. It had around 200,000 Jews and the only metropolis in the world with a larger percentage of Jews. So Warsaw had around 33% Jews at the time and Budapest had around 20% Jews. In a humorous fashion, the cartoon identified Budapest with its Jewish population, tapping into a widespread perception at the turn of the century, and even today to some extent, the Hungary's capital city was shaped and defined by its large number of Jewish inhabitants. Budapest's Jewishness was not confined to a residential Jewish quarter or district. It suffused every aspect of the city's life. and architecture. In the eyes of its admirers and detractors alike, Budapest was different from the rest of the country. And this difference was generally attributed to the presence and the influence of its Jews. Budapest is sometimes called the Paris of the East. As I learned are about another dozen or so cities, including Tehran and Istanbul. Um, but in the 1890s, it acquired a new, less flattering nickname, Budapest or Judapest, as I, I'm going to pronounce it here, but in the German or Hungarian, it was Judapest. Karl Lueger, the anti-Semitic mayor of Vienna, whose statue here you can see has been vandalized recently, and rightly so, um, 
Um, he hated the Hungarians more than he hated the Jews. And he's often credited with coming up with this derogatory nickname. So it's probably safer to actually credit him for popularizing it. Vienna's Catholic aristocratic newspaper, Das Vaterland, began using the term in the early 1890s when attacking the civil marriage bill that would have given uh, Jews and, and Christians the right to, to marry actually, um, when it was being debated in the Hungarian parliament and it was swiftly adopted by anti-liberal publications across Austria-Hungary. Some Hungarian newspapers took umbrage, but others readily adopted the term to denigrate the foreign culture emanating from the capital city. As a Hungarian Catholic Weekly observed in 1896, I'm quoting, foreigners come here and they surely see that Luegr speaks the truth because Budapest is Judapest. The Jews falsify our language, our foodways, our history, end quote. From the 1890s onward, the name Judapest was regularly invite, invoked by those who thought the Hungarian capital was out of step with or even inimical to the true Hungarian spirit. The question of Budapest's Hungarianness was older than the city itself. Budapest existed in the Hungarian nationalist imagination long before it existed on the map. Only in 1873 did Budapest officially come into being when the Hungarian parliament passed a bill amalgamating three separate municipalities, Pest, Buda, and Obuda, into one unified city. Just to give you some perspective, this was 25 years before a similar unification took place on the other side of the Atlantic, when Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx became New York City. In contradistinction to its American counterpart, however, Budapest aspired not only to be a thriving commercial and cultural center, but also a national capital. When Budapest was created, however, Hungary was not a nation state, but rather a multinational, multilingual, and multi-confessional kingdom within the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And its lands encompass parts of today's Slovakia, Romania, Ukraine, Serbia, Croatia, Austria, even a sliver of Poland. The majority of the kingdom's population did not even speak Hungarian as their everyday language, let alone as their mother tongue. Until the 1860s, this was also the case in Pest Buda. And Pest Buda is what Budapest was often called before its unification. Um, and at that point, it still more or less had a German speaking majority. This legacy was still apparent seven years after unification. According to the 1880 census, less than 60% of Budapest population declared Hungarian as their mother tongue. 34% declared German, 6% Slovak, and 3% other languages. More remarkably, a mere 18% of Budapest population spoke only Hungarian. This was a very, very multilingual population with a predilection for German. Many pronounced Pest as Pest, and they preferred to call Buda and Obuda by their German names, Ofen and Aldofen. The newspaper of record, the Pester Lloyd, was published in German, and until 1896, the official language of the Budapest Commodity and Stock Exchange, the most important economic center, financial center, was German. Pest Buda, as Robert Nemesh has pointed out, was the holy city for Hungarian activists, the focal point of their national ambitions. Situated on the Danube, at the crossroads of important trade routes, Pest Buda had become the administrative, cultural, and economic center of Habsburg-controlled Hungary in the 18th century, and eventually also became the political capital. Hungarian activists wanted to make foreign Buda, Pest Buda more Hungarian, primarily by promoting Hungarian language and culture among its highly heterogeneous inhabitants. At the end of the 18th century, the population consisted largely of Germans, Hungarians, and so-called Greeks. These were Greek Orthodox, so they weren't actually um, from Greece by and large, or Greek speakers. There were also, of course, Jews. First in Obuda, which you see as Roman numeral three, um, and then increasingly in Pest, which is on the east side of the Danube. Um, and around 1800, Pest Buddha and Obuda, which of course become a major metropolis, were little more than small towns of mud and dirt, with a combined population of roughly 50,000. And until the middle of the 19th century, there was not even a permanent bridge 
connecting Pest with Buddha and Obuda. There was a rickety pontoon bridge, which was installed during the spring thaw and then removed before the, it iced over in the winter. So this was the only way to actually get between Buddha and Pest at times or by boat or by walking over the ice sometimes. In the course of the 19th century, as Pest Buddha became Budapest, the city's population grew exponentially from 50,000 in 1800 to more than 730,000 in 1900. The small town of Mud and Dirt became Europe's eighth largest metropolis. And by the end of the century, Budapest had emerged as the continent's fastest growing city. Sometimes it was Berlin, sometimes it was Budapest, depending on the measurement you use. The so-called American pace of growth invited comparisons to American cities. Budapest, the largest flour milling center in Europe, was the Minneapolis of Europe. It was on its way to becoming the Chicago of the Balkans. As Lajos Kalkovani Deutsch wrote in 1910, Hungary has risen from a rudimentary agricultural people to a higher rank. This is the era of economic growth and progress. This is the era of the country's Europe, and then he corrects himself, it's Americanization. Budapest will become the Chicago of the Balkans. As Hatwani Deutsch, the scion of an ennobled Hungarian Jewish milling family well knew, much of this economic growth and progress was produced and propelled by the city's Jews. Um, the modern history of Jewish settlement in Budapest begins in the 18th century in Obuda. Um, there was a medieval settlement in Buda, which basically came to an end when um, Ottoman rule came to an end. Now I'm gonna be focusing much more on Pest um, so the eastern side of the Danube, which is where the population really um, started growing at the end of the 18th century, um, once Jews were allowed to stay overnight in Pest and go to the marketplace, which you can see on the left. Um, they were allowed to stay in an inn called the Orzi House, Orzi Haz, which is right near this marketplace. Um, and this is really where the heart of the Jewish community was from the late 18th century and through much of the 19th century, it's where the Jewish communal institutions were, it's where there were two synagogues in the courtyard. Um, and it's from here that Jewish settlement radiated outward. First to a place called Theresvaros or Theresienstadt in German, so named after the Habsburg monarch. And this is where this became a lower middle class to middle class district. And it was home to three quarters of Pest Jews between 1820 and 1857. The other important center here, neighborhood is Lipodvaros or Leopoldstadt, named after another Habsburg monarch. And this was the upscale banking and finance district. And this was home to roughly a quarter of Pest Jews in the same period. So those of you that know New York, this is like the Lower East Side Jews versus the Upper East Side Jews. Um, later in the 1870s and 1880s, the Jewish economic elite built and moved into monumental mansions on the main avenue that was built which is now called Andrashi Avenue. And this is the city's Grand Boulevard. Poor Jews moved to other neighborhoods as well. Um, and what's significant is that Budapest, none of these districts had a Jewish majority, but Jews were very well represented in all of the, all of these districts that I mentioned. Um, and in some cases they were almost 40% of the population. Um, now I'm gonna show you some numbers. In the last third of the 19th century, when Budapest was experiencing its fastest growth, the city's Jewish population increased more rapidly than its total population, rising from 16.6% .6 in 1869 to 25% of the total in 1900. In the same period, the Jewish population increased as a percentage of Hungary's total Jewish population. So the Jews of Budapest were 8.3% of the country's Jewish population, and then they became 22% by 1900. And this was growth that primarily came not from outside of Hungary, but from the countryside moving to the city. And by the end of the 19th century, Budapest and particularly Pest became the undisputed center of, of Jewish life. And I'm gonna focus now on some aspects of that economic life, as well as uh, political life and cultural life. So agrarian Hungary um, 
had a, its modern capitalist economy was built on the foodstuffs industry. And Jews played a vital role, first as grain wholesalers, then as agricultural industrialists, and then finally as bankers and financiers. And Michael Silber has uh, written extensively on this in his Jews in the Hungarian economy. Um, and we can see that many of these Lipotvaros Jews, the wealthier Jews, helped establish institutions to transform Budapest not only into the Minneapolis of Europe, but also into Central Europe's second most important financial center after Vienna. Ignaz Deutsch, the grandfather of the above mentioned Lajos Atmani Deutsch, worked in banking and, and insurance, financed the construction of railways and established flour mills. His descendants were among the 370 Hungarian Jews who gained noble titles in part for their contributions to the Hungarian economy. Anti-Semites regularly drew attention to the outsize role of Budapest Jews in banking and finance. Nowhere in the world is the world of finance so exclusively the prerogative of the Jews as it is to our great misfortune in our homeland, wrote Zoltan Bosniak, a notorious Hungarian anti-Semite. This is in 1935 that he wrote this. Here in Hungary, the bankocracy or the rule of the banks is synonymous with the Judeocracy, the rule of the Jews. Bosniak singled out the Budapest commodity and stock exchange in particular. The 100% Semitic character of the Budapest Stock Exchange is sufficiently well known. He certainly exaggerated, but not by much. In fact, the Budapest Stock Exchange had so many Jewish brokers that it was officially closed on Yom Kippur. Just to give you a, a sense of the significance of this, not even the New York Stock Exchange is ever closed on Yom Kippur, unless maybe it fell on a Saturday or Sunday. The only other stock exchange in the world um, at this point I assume the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange is closed on, on Yom Kippur, but the only other one in the world that was closed at this time was in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, the president of the Stock Exchange in, at the turn of the century was Jigmund Kornfeld, a Bohemian-born Hungarian Jew who also served as managing director of the Hungarian General Credit Bank, a key player in developing the country's food, railway, petroleum, and iron industry. Lipotvaros Jews, were highly conspicuous, but they were far outnumbered by the Tedes Vados Jews, the street peddlers, retailers, craftsmen, tailors, grocers, porters, and popular entertainers who made up the largest part of Budapest's Jewish population. And I'm quoting from a, a, a book that is quoted by my friend and colleague Miklos Konrad, um, poor Jews have their homeland here, wrote the novelist Tomasz Kobor, who grew up in Tedes Vados in the 1870s. Jewish institutional life in Budapest was shaped by the Lipot Vados Jews, who supported, supported policies that urged Hungarian Jews to adopt the external signs of Hungarian national life in order to pass or fit seamlessly within a national culture. This is a quote from Mary Gluck. They were standard bearers of neology, a conservative and distinctly Hungarian brand of reform Judaism whose adherents fervently promoted modernization and viewed themselves as Hungarians of the Israelite faith. So they were first and foremost Hungarians and their Judaism was their confession or religion. They built the Dohan Street Synagogue that our tour guide was pointing out at the beginning. Um, and this is uh, in the second, early, early second half of the 19th century. This was a towering Moorish style house of worship that announced in a proud and unabashed way that the Jews were um, there to stay. They also um, ran a competition for an even grander synagogue that was never built. And this was one that was going to be in Lipot Vados. And you can see some of the plans for this here from the competition. You can see how almost um, uh, how tremendous this is in size. In Budapest, the modernization of Jewish life was on full display in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Between 1880 and 1910, the percentage of Jews in Budapest who declared Hungarian as their mother tongue rose from 59% to 90%. And the percentage of Hungarian speakers rose from 79% to 97%. Still, the vast majority, 67% in 1910, also spoke German. As Michael Silber has reminded us, Despite rapid and almost complete modernization, 
Budapest was still the largest German speaking urban Jewry in Europe after Vienna, easily surpassing Berlin. This is something that we always forget. We think of Hungary as being a Hungarian speaking Jewry, but this was also very much a German speaking Jewry, even though the Jews increasingly declared Hungarian as their primary language. And to give you a sense of this, sermons at the Dohan Street Synagogue, the Grand Central Synagogue, were given not only in Hungarian, but also in German. One of the great Mendelssohn biographers um, was one of the German preachers at the synagogue. And at the Franz Josef National Rabbinical Seminary, which was founded in 1877 and still exists to this day, the language of instruction naturally was Hungarian, but Talmud was studied in the Holy Tongue. And of course the Holy Tongue here was German. So it was inconceivable that Talmud could be studied in Hungarian, even in Budapest, it was studied in German. Budapest Jews could participate in national and political and municipal politics only after the emancipation of Hungarian Jewry in 1867. Like the majority of Hungarians, however, most Hungarian Jews could not exercise the right to vote until 1918 when universal manhood suffrage and partial women's suffrage were finally introduced. Until then, suffrage was highly limited. It was restricted to the approximately 8% of the population that met the minimum property education and tax paying requirements. Moreover, in Hungary cities, half of the, of the municipal council seats were reserved for so-called virilists. And these were the highest taxpayers and they had a, a certain privilege. And if you, take this into consideration, Jews actually constituted. Keep in mind, Jews are around 20% of the population of Budapest in the late 19th century, but they constituted a majority of the city's municipal councilmen on the eve of the First World War. And it's, it's a remarkable fact that, you know, maybe we'll take a, take a second to sink in. And this was one of the reasons why Karl Eger called the city Budapest or Budapest. Electorally, Lipot Varos and Teres Varos were considered Jewish wards. And this was readily apparent in 1869, the first Hungarian national election in which Jews had the right to vote. In Lipot Varos, where an estimated 57% of the electorate was Jewish, Mor Varman made history as the first professing Jew elected to the Hungarian parliament. Varman, a banker, a member of the Stock Exchange Council, and later head of press Neolog Jewish community tried to campaign as a member of the merchant class, but he was elected and always seen as the Jewish candidate. One of his signature achievements is relevant for us tonight, co-sponsoring a bill to unify Budapest. In Teres Varos, no Jew ran for office in 1869, but both candidates pandered to the district's Jewish voters and most newspapers considered the Jewish vote decisive. Liberalism remained strong in Budapest until the dissolution of the Habsburg monarchy, thanks in large part to the Jewish vote and to the very limited franchise in Hungary, which actually privileged the Jewish vote. Many of Hungary's Jewish parliamentarians also served as municipal councilmen, including Ferenc Helpai, who served as mayor of Budapest for a few months in 1913. A Jewish mayor would have been completely unimaginable in Vienna, where I am right now, where liberalism had beat a hasty retreat. And it was unimaginable in Budapest after 1920, when the municipal electoral, electoral laws were rewritten with the express purpose of marginalizing the city's Jews. The municipal legislation of 1920 was passed after the Treaty of Trianon reduced post-war Hungary's territory by three quarters and its population by two thirds leaving Budapest as the only major city in an increasingly homogeneous country. The legislation was a response to two failed revolutions, the Hungarian Democratic Revolution of 1918 and the Hungarian Soviet Revolution of 1919, both of which came to be identified as Jewish because of the prominent role played in them by Hungarians of Jewish origin, many of who themselves didn't identify themselves as Jewish, but they were identified as Jewish by others. The municipal legislation of 1920 was an effort to de-Jewify Budapest, or in the words of the illiberal Hungarian writer who I'm going to talk about right now, Deja Sabo, this was um, an effort to recapture Budapest from its Jewish occupiers. 
The Hungarian anti-Semitic library is full of scholarly and pseudo-scholarly literature about the Jewification of Budapest. Marshalling a whole barrage of statistics to show how thoroughly the Hungarian capital's economic, political, and cultural life had been hijacked by the Jews or contaminated by the Jewish spirit. The most infamous of these is this work here by Zoltan Bosniak, The Jewification of Our Capital City, which I quoted from earlier. And it drew extensively from Alois Kovács's Jury's Usurpation of Hungary, which you can see on the right, published in 1922. Kovács, who was the head of the Hungarian Statistical Office, distinguished between so-called Western and Eastern Jews, viewing the Western Jews as best suited to be Hungarians because they had regular contact with Hungarian culture and were not as segregated from the rest of the population, nor were they resistant to, and they were more resistant, sorry, to metropolitan, international, and destructive currents in his terms. Budapest Jews, he lamented, came largely from the East. And their lack of Hungarian morals and Hungarian national feeling in his eyes made them more likely to succumb to, quote, international and destructive anti-national ideas. For Kovács, Bosniak, and others, Budapest was the counterpoint to authentic rural Hungary. It was a liberal and libertine city corrupted by capitalism and communism, cosmopolitanism and commercialism. The anti-Semitic writer Deja Sabo valorized the Hungarian peasantry in his 1919 novel, The Eroded Village, and blamed Budapest's assimilated urbanized Jews for usurping Hungary's capital city and supplanting Hungary's pure peasant culture with ostentation, salaciousness, and sensationalism. In a 1921 essay, Recapturing Budapest, Sabo criticized his fellow Hungarians for allowing the corrosive foreigner to purloin and poison the country's heart and demanded that the capital city be returned to the hardworking, heroic, and honorable Hungarians who are its rightful owners in his terms. Sabo wrote this essay during the counter-revolutionary white terror a three-year orgy of anti-Semitic and anti-leftist violence that claimed thousands of Jewish lives. In his telling, however, it was not Hungary's Jews who had been martyred, but Hungary's capital city. The Jews of Budapest, he insisted, had benefited at the expense of the hardworking, heroic, and honorable Hungarians. The Jews' banks and company and abominable stock exchange exploited the daily sweat of the worker, their theaters, cabarets, orpheums, bordellos, and bright lit bars were nothing but dens of soulless hedonism. Their newspapers and publishing houses polluted, poisoned, and dominated the public sphere. Their lawyers, doctors, and engineers overwhelmed all the professions where work is easy and money is unlimited. In Sabo's view, Jews had turned Budapest into a flashy, meretricious city whose rightful owners had been dislocated and dispossessed. He implored his readers to take notice of this grave injustice. And this is the quote that I have up here, which I'm not going to read from. Sabo proposed drastic measures, including the deportation of all Jews who had settled in Budapest after 1910, with the aim of wresting the Hungarian capital from this predatory and usurpatory Asian tribe, in his terms. Sabo is often contrasted with Andre, uh, Andre Adi one of Hungary's greatest avant-garde poets who had a more positive appraisal of Jewish Budapest. In a posthumously published essay titled Korovori, he portrayed Hungary's Jews as a kind of leavening agent or yeast who helped Budapest, turn Budapest into a vibrant, scintillating, and almost European city. In the essay, composed in 1917 but published after the war, he wrote the following. But isn't it true that among us nobodies, meaning us Hungarians, who are highly diverse even in our uniformity, there are one million intermingled Jews. Isn't it true that these Jews made Budapest for us? And they made all those things that perhaps, no surely, do not exist yet, but from afar look so alluringly European. They, a people that do not exist, came to help us, a people that no longer exists. Andi acknowledged the inherent tension in Hungarian Jewish relations, and it was this tension he believed that made Budapest so much more than the peasant village of Sabo's imagination. Still, he made a distinction between us and them, 
between Hungarians and Jews, viewing them as two separate peoples entangled in a, quote, drunken death dance. It was a dance of erotic love hate with Jews performing the music and Hungarians dancing at their feet. As such, it was hardly a metaphor for mutually beneficial Hungarian Jewish symbiosis. In fact, it symbolized a kind of burst of frenetic cultural creativity ending in a spiral of death. They wait as we dance, Abi wrote, squeezing out our last drop of love, our last drop of life. In spite of its inherent pessimism, Adi's Korobori has served as the foundation for another vision of, of Budapest, not the one disparaged by Karl Weger, Deja Sabo, and others, but one that has been reappropriated by contemporary scholars and activists who have attempted to identify the unique Jewish contribution to the Hungarian capital. The provocatively titled Jewish Budapest, originally published in Hungarian in 1995, describes what might be called visible Jewish Budapest, the Orzi House, the Dohan Street Synagogue, and the hundreds of buildings, both religious and secular, that were built, financed, or used by Budapest Jews. More recently, Mary Gluck has published a book titled The Invisible Jewish Budapest, uh, Metropolitan Culture at the Fondasiek, uh, 2016, which explores how the Teres Vados Jews in particular created Budapest modernist metropolitan culture in the city's coffee houses, music halls, middle brown newspapers, and satirical journals, like the one quoted at the beginning of this talk. Other scholars like the architectural historian Frederick Bedouar and Rudolf Klein have placed the emphasis on the Lipodvaros Jews, arguing that their embrace of secessionism and l'art nouveau, the, uh, the art, these uh, artistic movements of the, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, shape the direction of modernist architecture in the Hungarian capital. In many respects, these works are all variations on the cartoon cited at the beginning. They tend to view Budapest as Budapest, but with a positive twist. The city's defining material and spiritual culture, they argue, is inherently Jewish, or at least the product of Hungarian Jews urban encounter with modernity. In their view, Budapest is not a term of opprobrium or shame, but a celebration of Budapest Jews and their outsized role in shaping the city's economic, political, and cultural life. And what I'd like to do um, with the remaining few minutes of this talk is show you how this myth of Budapest and this reappropriation of this term has uh, impacted some aspects of, the po of popular culture in contemporary Hungary. So this is a talk that is primarily dealing with the uh, end of the 19th century, but the end of the 20th and beginning of the 20th, first century also sees a kind of um, valorization and promotion of a certain kind of uh, Jewish Budapest uh, along the lines maybe of what Adi was talking about, but with an unambiguously positive twist. And one example of this is a blog um, that was started by uh, Bruno Bitter um, back in the early 21st century. And you can see that it was called Budapest and it dealt with a kind of hipster approach to modern uh, urban Jewish culture, it dealt a lot with Hungarian Jewish identity and the very use of the term Budapest here was meant to be provocative because this was a term that in the early 21st century, and even today to some extent, is a common term of opprobrium, a common insult um, from the anti-Semitic right and also from the conservative, uh, mildly anti-Semitic right. Uh, and this is a blog that no longer exists, but it is partially archived online. And you can see if you know Hungarian, there's also some English contributions um, that it tries to be provocative also in the topics that it, uh, that it broaches. Um, another example of this, we looked at Budapest the blog, and there's Budapest the store, which opened a few years ago, right in the heart of the, what is now known as the Jewish Quarter, which some people refer to as the party district because it is gradually losing its um, character as the Jewish Quarter. Uh, and a gift shop uh, opened up um, a few years ago called Budapest, 
and which is also meant to be striking and provocative and also it sells trendy um, and uh, tre trendy um, artworks and, and Judaica. Uh, I'm not actually sure what the fate of this Budapest is during the current pandemic. Um, it's possible that it no longer exists. I haven't been to Budapest in a long time to check up on this, uh, though its Facebook page is still active. And this is a term that has also been embraced, embraced by various Jewish organizations in Hungary that organize a annual street festival, which is not called Yudapest, but it is called Yudafest or Yudafest. And this is a Jewish cultural celebration, um, which brings together in particular secular Jewish organizations in Budapest to celebrate um, the, the Jewishness of the Jewish quarter, but also to some extent um, to celebrate a perceived Jewish contribution to Hungarian culture. Um, so what we see here and what I've tried to show you is that this is a term that emerged out of a very, very distinctive context in Budapest at the end of the 19th century at a time when Jews were perceived, especially by anti-Semites like Karl Weger, to be overrepresented and over influential in the political, economic and cultural life of Budapest and by extension Hungary. And this is a term that has gone through various uh, um, changes over the course of the late 19th, 20th century and early 21st century. And now this is a term which is still used by Hungarian anti-Semites. Um, there are some uh, recent political um, advertisements that I didn't want to show because I felt like I might offend some people's sensibilities, but Yudapest is still a term that is in use um, on the Hungarian anti-Semitic right. Um, but it is increasingly a term that has been embraced by what I would call um, culturally avant-garde hipster Jews who are trying to celebrate um, the Jewishness of a city which they, um, they, they love and embrace and want to um, point out that, uh, that um, the, the Jewishness is important to the, the, to, to the character of the city today. And this is something that really emerged in the years after the fall of communism. And I think it probably peaked about a decade ago, but this trend is still something that is, is, is noticeable. Uh, so this was our tour starting um, in Budapest in 1892 and taking us until the present. And I very much welcome any questions or comments that people have. Well, thank you very much, um, Michael, um, for this fascinating talk. And um, I would just say there's some wonderful Jewish restaurants in Budapest, which we can all explore one day. Um, so we've got a few um, uh, great questions coming in and uh, please keep posting your questions in the Q&A or in the chat and I'll pick them up. Um, and um, we've got one or two general questions, one or two more specific questions. And we might start, I think, perhaps so we've got a question here um, from Jeremy Rose, which is whether you could say a bit more about the intellectual and religious structures in the Jewish community. Um. Yeah, I'll say a little bit about this, um, especially in the, the, the late Habsburg period that I've been focusing on. Um, you're familiar with the, the Jewish joke about uh, the Jewish Robinson Caruso, who um, is stranded on a desert island. He's rescued and his rescuer discovers that there are, there's one Jew and two synagogues. And the rescuer asks, why is it that you have two synagogues here? And the Jewish Robinson Crusoe says, this is the synagogue that I daven in, and this is the synagogue that I would never be caught dead in. And the difference is that in Hungary, the Robinson Crusoe built three synagogues, not just two. Um, there was a, um, a schism in Hungary um, between 1868 and 1871. And this is following the emancipation of, of Habsburg Jewry in 1867, when there was an effort to set up a, um, a umbrella organization along the lines of the Board of Deputies in England or the Consistoire in, uh, in France. Uh, and this effort to set up a umbrella organization, of course, brought out the divisions. And the primary division was between the Neolog Jews, or the ones who had a reform tendency, and the Orthodox Jews those who range from what we might call modern orthodox to ultra-orthodox today. Uh, 
although ultra orthodoxy is really only emerging at this time. Um, and they form separate um, nationwide organizations, one for the Neolog, one for the Orthodox. And then there was a group that didn't want to join either one of these organizations and they became known as status quo ante, meaning status quo before the schism. So these three organizations um, um, lasted up until 1944 when they were forcibly unified. Um, then the schism returned again after the Holocaust and they were forcibly unified again under communism. Um, and then they were, the schism reemerged again after the fall of communism. So today there is an Orthodox establishment, very small, a Neolog establishment, which is a little bit larger. Um, and there are several groups that are laying claim to the title of status quo ante. It's kind of a, 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 a jolly joker to some extent that fits all. Um, so that is um, more or less the, um, the organizational structure of the, the Jewish community. Is there another aspect of that that? Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, we have a question about anti-Semitism around 1900 um, and how this uh, really manifested itself. Would you say that actually uh, the Jews were very affected by anti-Semitism or is it the case that with the um, majority council, the council would have um, managed to block too much damage to the Jewish community? It, depend it depends what is meant by how they're affected by anti-Semitism. If we're talking about um, anti-Semitic violence, um, this, is the, this is something that uh, Jews of Hungary experienced in uh, the early 1880s during the Tisa Esslinger blood libel trial um, that led to popular um, attacks on Jews. Um, in terms of political anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism in the Habsburg period really reached its peak around the time of the Tisa Eslar blood libel trial. So this is 1882, 1883, when there was a short-lived anti-Semitic party. Um, and the very fact that this anti-Semitic party did not actually um, last for more than a few years is a sign that the political system um, did not favor um, this kind of mass politics. It's in large part because Hungary um, retained limited suffrage. So as I mentioned, a very, very small percentage of the population actually had the right to vote. Um, and many of the and the, those who had the right to vote were the, the wealthier, um, the, you know, they were taxpayers, wealthy property owners. And as you can see from many statistics, this privileged the Jews, especially in Budapest, where on the eve of World War One, they represented the majority of the population. And to a large extent, the um, state-sponsored anti-Semitism of the post-World War I period um, is, um, represents a, there's some continuities there, the, the rhetoric continues, but in terms of the, the role that these anti-Semitic parties played in the 1920s and 1930s, this was a function of a, of a, of a massively transformed Hungary, a Hungary that had lost most of its non- Hungarian speaking population, a hunger, hunger that had lost um, a large percentage of its territory and had new grievances that were basically directed against the Jews. So what we saw in Deja Sabo's um, uh, article that I quoted from, this became much more of a mainstream um, view of, of Jews in Budapest that Jews had somehow overstepped the boundaries that Jews had too much power and had to be put in their place. Right, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Erika Sivosh from uh, Budapest, I think, um, who would like to, um, you said quite a bit about um, Luega's view of um, Jews in Budapest, and uh, she wants to know really about um, the view of the Jews of Vienna. Do we, do we have um, an understanding of how Jews in Vienna actually saw the Jewish culture in Budapest, or how, did they have a kind of narrative of their own about the um, Jewish, uh, Jewishness of Budapest? Um, first of all, hello, Erica. Wish I could see the participants out here. Um, 
This is not something that I have researched extensively. So I have looked through the Viennese press in the late 19th century just to get a sense of how the term Budapest is used. Um, and this is, of course, a term that is um, embraced by the, um, the, the Catholic conservative press. Um, you know, we do have uh, one of the, the hardest parts of your question, Erica, is defining what a Viennese Jew is, because so many of the Viennese Jews in this period actually came from uh, the Kingdom of Hungary. Um, so if we consider Theodor Herzl, let's say, a Viennese Jew, um, his perspectives on Hungary may differ from those of others. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question, but I don't, I don't have a, an answer to this in part because I think it's, it's hard to define actually what a Viennese Jewish um, perception would be. Though a lot of the Viennese um, politicians of all stripes were very critical of Hungary because they felt, many felt that Hungary had gotten um, too good of a deal in 1867 when the dual monarchy was created after the Ausgleich. And many liberal Jews also um, shared this view in, in Austria, but I, don't, I can't really speak about a, a Viennese Jewish perspective on, on Hungary in this respect. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a, a different kind of question here from Maria Diemling. Could you comment on the use of Moorish style for synagogue architecture? It's an interesting choice for an ethnic minority seeking acceptance, like a visual self-othering or Orientalism in full sight. Okay, hello, Maria. I wish I could see you as well. Um, thank you for the question. This, this is, um, yeah, the, the, the traditional view of this is that, um, uh, Moorish architecture, especially in the German speaking world, is a way of um, um, finding a architectural idiom that is linked to uh, the, um, the golden age of Spain. Somehow this, uh, this uh, glorified version of the golden age of Spain when there was a kind of convivencia, when Jews, Muslims uh, lived together, Jews participated in the surrounding culture um, and we see a trend, especially in German um, reform Judaism, um, that, uh, that uh, in Ismar Schorsch's terms, this is the, um, I think he calls it the um, superiority of Sephardic, Sephardic Jewry, that Ashkenazic Jews, especially in um, the German speaking world, begin to look at Sephardic Jewry as a model. And this is one of the reasons why architecture, um, why, why synagogue architecture adopts this Byzantine or Moorish style. Um, in the Hungarian context, it's very different because Hungarian Jews, Hungarians in general, first of all, view themselves as an, uh, an Asian people, right? So in this context, the Jews' orientalness um, was in keeping with the larger Hungarian national um, narrative. So there's this idea that Arpad, the father of the Hungarians, and Abraham, the father of the Jews, were somehow related. They both came from Mesopotamia, according to one legend. Um, so there are some scholars who have talked about Moorish architecture in the Hungarian context, um, not being an embrace of, of, let's say, differentness or differences as, as it is in the, the German-speaking world, but it's some way, uh, it's a way of uh, claiming membership in the Hungarian nation, also that the, the, the Jews are just as Asiatic as the Hungarians, and that somehow the Moorish architecture is a reflection of this. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of questions here, so I'm going to have to be selective, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to choose a, a Jewish, non-Jewish question. Um, were there Philo-Semitic Hungarian Christian groups or writers in Budapest around 1900? Um, Yes, yeah, so I guess this is an appropriate question for the Parks Institute lecture as well. Um, one example of this is uh, um, Andre Adi, uh, who I quoted from. This Kori Bori piece um, is generally seen as a Hungarian philo-Semite. Um, Mor Yokai, who is an important um, Hungarian writer, also known as Morris Yokai um, in, uh, in English, um, was also generally celebrated by Jews as one of their closest friends. Um, and in general, liberal, <clears throat> Hungarian liberal politics in 
the late 19th and early 20th century tended to be what we might call philo-Semitic. Um, and this is in large part because the Jews were seen as uh, an important um, vote. And we saw this in the, the way that they represented in Budapest, that um, it was important not to alienate uh, the Jewish vote, but also because Jews were very important in the larger Hungarian national project. Um, in uh, the 1870s, 1880s, Hungarian speakers did not represent a majority of the Kingdom of Hungary. So the titular nation did not actually represent a majority, at least the speakers of Hungarian were not. And Jews who constituted about um, 6%, 5 to 6% of the total population of Hungary embraced the Magyar language, embraced, embraced Magyar culture. So for this larger nationality conflict within Hungary, um, Jews played a very important role and liberal Hungarian politicians uh, made an effort not to alienate them. Um, so if we, I don't know if that would be called philo-Semitism, but certainly there was a, um, a recognition that the Jews were an important part of Hungarian society and politics on the part of a large swath of Hungarian society. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Mark Jan Prokopovich. Um, could you say a little bit more about the Western versus Eastern Jews in terms of where they came from and what their relationship was to each other? So I think also kind of general question about assimilation perhaps there as well. Okay. Hi, Mark Jan. Again, I wish I could see you out there. Um, so the, there, there's two, I guess I can answer this question in, in two ways. One is myth and one is reality. Um, Miklos Konrad has written about the, the myth of the Galician invasion. And this was actually very, very central in the, um, the larger anti-Semitic discourse in the late 19th and especially in the 20th centuries. That, and we saw this already in the, um, the Aloyash Kovac quote that I gave, this distinction between East and West, that the Eastern Jews were seen as unassimilable and the Jews, especially in the Eastern parts of Hungary, were seen as um, Galician Jews who were foreign to the Hungarian people. Whereas the Jews in Transdanubia, the areas to the west of the, the Danube and the south of the Danube, um, were seen as much more integrated and acculturated into Hungary. These were Jews who came largely from Bohemia and Moravia um, in the 18th century. Uh, 17th and 18th centuries and settled in these areas. They were less concentrated in these areas. And this is one of the reasons why the, the Western Jew was seen as somehow um, preferable in the eyes of um, people like Alejos Kovac. Um, but again, a lot of this was a, you know, more myth than reality. Um, this idea that um, Jewish uh, uh, arrival in in Hungary was relatively new, that most of the Jews in the East came from places like, uh, from Galicia. And it's interesting, um, a um, historian, um, Hungarian historian, um, Kover, um, George Kover has written a book on Tisza Esla, the blood libel trial, uh, which occurred in the Eastern part of Hungary. Um, and the impression in the contemporary press is that these were all Eastern European Galician Jews who had just arrived in Hungary. But in reality, the majority of these Jews had actually been in Hungary for um, uh, a generation or two, right? So this East-West um, mm -hmm. rhetoric is actually um, was, um, it's, it's, it's much more, I would say, a category of practice than a category of analysis um, in the way that it's used in, in the literature. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to put two questions together here. Um, uh, one of them is, um, they're really both about um, persecution and the fate of the Jews in the Holocaust, uh, in a way. Um, one is about um, how big is the Jewish population since the Holocaust, and how many of those, um, one might say, are Hungarian, or are they post-war immigrants to Hungary? That's one question. The other question is an interesting one about the um, notorious House of Terror, um, from Sarah Adler, this question, saying that when she went there, she found there was no mention of the extermination of the Jewish population. Why is that? Okay, so 
So the first question, um, you know, at the end of the Holocaust, roughly 200,000 Jews survived. Um, this is around 30% of the, the total population of before the war. Um, in Budapest, around 70% of the Jews survived. But, so at the end of the war, there were around 200,000 Jews, 100,000 or so who survived in Hungary, in Budapest, and another 100,000 or so who returned from forced labor, who returned from hiding, who returned from concentration and death camps. Um, about half of them left between 1945 and in the revolution of 1956. And the way that I often look at this is that the ones who left were the ones for whom it was more important to be Jewish than Hungarian. And the ones who stayed are the ones who actually thought they could finally become Hungarian. Of course, there's exceptions to this as well. Um, and the, my colleague Andras Kovac, um, his estimate for the number of Jews today is somewhere between, it depends how you define a Jew, it depends uh, what category you're using, but it's somewhere, um, I think he, the numbers he uses are between 80,000 and 100 or 120,000. These are Jews who are mostly located, or individuals who are mostly located in Budapest, because the Jews of the countryside, meaning the areas outside of Budapest, were largely exterminated, and those who survived either left the country or moved to Budapest by and large. So the Jewish population in Hungary today is basically survivors and children and grandchildren and great grandchildren of survivors. Um, this is not an immigrant Jewish community, though there are some Jews who have immigrated from outside of Hungary's borders. So from Hungarian speaking Jews often from Ukraine or Slovakia or from former Yugoslavia. Um, there are also, there were some Georgian Jews who moved to Hungary after the, um, the fall of communism. Um, I was a immigrant Jew in, in Hungary for about 20 years, but now I'm in Vienna. Uh, so I was actually one of the exceptions because most of the, the Jews in Hungary are in fact, um, uh, can trace their ancestry back several generations. And as far as I know, this is probably one of the largest non-immigrant Jewish communities in the world. Um, and with regard to the House of Terror, I have to confess that I have only read about the House of Terror. I've never actually stepped foot in it. Um, and um, what I do know is that the House of Terror basically tries to um, um, equate the crimes of um, fascism with the crimes of communism. And the emphasis is much more on the crimes of the communists after 1948 and much less so on the crimes of the Germans and the Hungarian fascists in uh, 1944, not to mention the period before 1944. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and we've got a few big questions here, which I'll just throw at you, one of them at you. Um, question from Michael um, Nutkovitz in New Mexico. Thank you for joining us. Um, who is um, wants to know whether you could contrast or compare the situation of Budapest with that of Prague in the fantasy Eckler. Both, both of these cities had a nationalism that fought the Germanization in, in their cities and a Germanization rather identified with the Jews. Are there more similarities we should think about? I mean, I, I would say to some extent it's, it's like comparing the, the Jews of New York and the Jews of Minneapolis um, in, terms of, in terms of size. Right, that Budapest has um, a 20% of the population is Jewish. And this is, I forget what the actual number is at the turn of the century, but this is you know, approaching, um, what is the exact number here? Um, but it's, it's, it's a very, very large population. Whereas in Prague, the Jewish population um, peaks in the early modern period. Um, so Prague is one of the largest Jewish communities in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. But by the 19th and especially by the end of the 19th century, the Jewish population is um, quite, quite small. Um, and one of the main differences I would say between Prague and Budapest is the role that the nationality conflict plays. Because in Prague, the Jews to a large extent are caught between 
the majority Czechs and the minority Germans. Um, and historically have more of an affinity towards German language and culture. Think of Kafka or Max Brod. Uh, so the Jews are caught between these two movements, whereas in Budapest in the late 90s, in the last decades of the 19th century, the first decade and a half of the 20th century, the Jews are basically fully in line with the um, with liberal Hungarian nationalism. Uh, they're not caught between national movements. Um, There's some parts, let's say, in the eastern parts in uh, the Ruthenia, where Jews are are caught between uh, different populations, but by and large, the Jews are fully in line with uh, the, the, the titular Hungarian nationalism. Um, and this puts them into difficult situations in places like Upper Hungary or today Slovakia, where the Jews are identified with the uh, oppressive Magyars. Uh, and that, they, that the Jews are seen as the, the most uh, ardent Magyarizers, the um, Many of the, the school teachers are, see, are, are, are Jews, the Hungarian school teachers that are teaching Slovak children. Uh, so the Jews are not so much caught between the, they're not caught between nationality movements, um, except in some of these peripheral areas. So that's maybe the one area where the comparison with, with Pragmat Fit is in some areas like in, in today's Slovakia or in parts of today's um, Ukraine where, so the Subcarpathian and the Subcarpathian, these areas where the Jews were seen as representatives of the Hungarian, uh, the oppressive Hungarian majority, and they were resented in that, in that uh, from that perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, different type of question from Sonia Galantz. Um, she who was struck by the use of dance metaphors in some of the texts you quoted. Um, could you talk a bit more about how discussion of Jewish bodies figured into the idea of Jewish Budapest? Thank you, Sonia, who is around the corner here somewhere in Vienna. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> uh, so first of all, the, I think the, the strongest dance metaphor, and, and Sonia, by the way, is, is, has just published a book dealing with mixed dancing in the Jewish tradition. So there is, in Yiddish literature, so there is um, I see a, a direct uh, direct relevance to, to your research. Um, Korobori, um, which is the um, the article that I quoted by Andre Adi, where he talks about the Jews made Budapest for the Hungarians. Korobori is actually an is a, uh, Australian Aboriginal dance, um, and this is the metaphor that is used um, of the. Again, the Hungarians providing, or the, I guess the, 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 this is a, a, a death dance of some uh, some respects, where the, the Jews are um, performing the music and the Hungarians are dancing frenetically. Um, so that dance metaphor is clearly used um, because he chose the Kor Korobori um, Afri or Aboriginal uh, dance as his metaphor. Um, and it also struck me that. Uh, Dejo Sambo and others use this dance metaphor. And I'd have to, I'd have to think about why, why others chose this, um, this dance metaphor. Um, I'll, I'll have to think about that. It's not something that I have, it's something that I, I thought about as I was preparing this lecture and saw these multiple dance quotes, um, but I, I'd have to think about this. Okay, thank you. I think we may be coming soon to the end of the questions, but um, I, I'll throw in a few more. If that's um, Claire, Claire will um, scratch her nose if she thinks I should uh, draw it to an end. Um, what part did Zionism play in the life of Jews in Budapest? Um, I mean, one of the great ironies of, the, of political Zionism is that the two founders of political Zionism, Max Nordau and Theodor Herzl, were both born in Budapest. In fact, Herzl was born in 1860, right next to the, the great synagogue, the Dohan Street synagogue. Um, and both of them were very much aware that Hungarians, Hungarian Jews were not going to embrace Zionism in part because Zionism defined the Jews um, primarily as a nation, whereas at least the, 
mainstream Hungarian Jews to find their Judaism increasingly as a confession or religion. They may have actually seen it as a kind of, they may have had a tribal identity or an ethnic identity, but at least they, they define themselves as Hungarians of the Mosaic persuasion or Hungarians of the Israelite faith. Um, so Zionism actually challenged this um, self-identification. Um, that being said, there uh, are some, uh, what we would call orthodox or ultra-orthodox um, rabbis in the late 19th century that Michael Silver has worked on who um, expressed a certain kind of Jewish national identity that wasn't necessarily Zionism, but was a Jewish national identity. Um, Theodor Herzl was very much aware of the challenge of reaching Hungarian Jews. He talked about having to have a Zionism in red, white, and green, so the colors of the Hungarian flag. Um, but he sort of resigned himself to never actually being able to recruit the following amongst Hungarian Jews. The one period when Zionism is actually quite uh, popular, not surprisingly, is in the period from around 1945 to 1948. And uh, Attila Novak has written a book dealing with this transitional period. Um, and this is when Zionism, first of all, is legal. And there are Zionists who um, were involved in the resistance in 1944-45. Um, and this is right after the Holocaust when the idea of a Hungarian Jewish symbiosis of the idea that Hungarians are, the Jews are Hungarians of the Jewish faith or of the Israelite faith has been proven tragically wrong. Okay, thank you. And um, <clears throat> I think we're gonna have one last very short question here, um, which is a kind of um, an interesting, amusing one to end with. Um, you compared historic Budapest to both Chicago and Minneapolis. Uh, which U.S. city do you think it most now resembles and why? Uh, I think the, the answer is obvious, and that is New York. Uh, there's a, a book that was published um, about 20 years ago right now on New York and Budapest comparing them by Carl Shorsky and I think Thomas Bender. I, I forget his last name at this point. Um, and it's a collection of essays comparing these two cities. And it's not surprising that I started off with these two cities that were both unified at the, in the last decades of the 19th century. These are cities that were largely built by immigrant populations. Um, in the case of Budapest, these are immigrants from outside of the, the capital city. Um, so my, you know, um, this is part of the urbanization process. In, in New York, of course, these are immigrants in large part from other parts of the world. Um, these are both cities that were seen as quintessentially American in terms of the, the fast pace of growth, also in terms of the commercialization of, and the commodification of culture. Um, you know, the other city in Europe that was often compared to Chicago was Berlin. So Walter Rathenau referred to Berlin as a Chicago on the spray. And Berlin and Budapest were the two cities that were undergoing American growth. Uh, and this rapid um, breakneck speed growth in the course of the last decades of, the, of the, the 19th century. And this is one of the reasons why it was, these cities were often compared to American cities and often critically compared to American cities because it meant that um, any sort of rootedness uh, of the local was, was somehow lost and that these were cities that were high paced that were built for the modern era, that were built for, that were um, alienating impersonal cities. And this is something that was, um, this is one of the ways that Budapest was often described um, in the, the late 19th, early 20th century. So we can see this a little bit in some of the, uh, the quotes that I read, I think about the, the Jews of Budapest. Well, thank you very much. Um, we, we've had a huge range of questions. I'm sorry we can't fit them all in. Um, uh, but um, thank you very much to all of you for the questions. Uh, I'm going to pass now back to Claire, who's going to um, take us through a few um, odds and ends at the end of this. Yeah. Well, thank you first very much, uh, Michael, for this very rich insight into uh, uh, Jewish Budapest. And also, I must say, for 
juggling with such uh, in such a phlegmatic way the family life and your professional <laughs> life in this which is very typical of these times of covid but and also a last thank you to Cathy for suggesting to inviting you as usual it was a, a, a great idea just to say we our next parks event will be in two weeks time and it will be uh, on the lost names of lithuania so we will um, watch a documentary film and have a Q&A. If you are interested, please register. I've posted in the chat the link. And if you want to receive news from the Parks Institute, you can also sign up to our mailing list. And thank you, Marc Renoir, for sharing or for hosting and sharing the Q&A so brilliantly. And now uh, the final words for, to Mark's, Mark Smith. Okay, so uh, just to say, uh, thank you, Michael, for such a fascinating lecture and the uh, engaging questions, uh, which were really fascinating. So uh, a great way to celebrate the Parks uh, lecture. Uh, and also, can I thank uh, uh, colleagues who put this together, because I know these events just don't happen spontaneously and a lot of work goes into them. So thanks to the people who put the, the evening together. Uh, but most of all, can I also thank uh, the audience, because uh, there's no point really putting them on if people don't want to engage and the, the level of engagement we've had this evening has been fantastic and it really makes one of the key points about universities being a forum for ideas and discussion uh, come to life so thanks everyone uh, for the event thanks again michael uh, and have a nice evening